How Sleep the Brave by Walter de la Mare. Nay, nay, sweet England, do not grieve. Not one of these poor men who died, but did within his soul believe that death for thee was glorified. Ever they watched it hovering near, that mystery yon thought to plumb. Perchance, sometimes in loathed fear, they heard cold danger whisper, come. Heard and obeyed. O oh, if thou weep, such courage and honour, beauty, care, be it for joy that those who sleep only thy joy could share. Most of the World War I poetry that we're familiar with today is anti-war and it was written by men who experienced the fighting at close range. These were men who ate, slept and drank, sometimes only metres away from their enemy. And death was no abstract concept to them. It was a cold hard reality which could take any one of them at any moment and their poetry reflected their reality. In contrast, de la Mer had never worn a uniform in his life and being divorced from the hard reality of the battlefield, he gives us a more stoical, patriotic message. He wants his readers, the British public, to take inspiration from the deaths of their young men. He wants the reader to acknowledge the death, but also to dig deep and keep working towards the victory that will prove that they didn't die in vain. But even if they had died in vain, their deaths happened during a war. Death in time of war can be understood. It can be rationalised, it can even be accepted. But when lives are lost for no reason at all, and I'm talking here specifically about the horrific waste of life that we see today through PTSD related suicide, then families, relatives and friends find it a great deal harder to come to terms with their loss. For many soldiers coming home from Iraq and Afghanistan, reintegration back into normal society was always going to be difficult. <laughs> Many of us had seen or done things that would fundamentally change the way we saw the world. But for those returning with post-traumatic stress disorder, returning to a normal existence was going to be an even bigger challenge. For them, a new kind of battle was just about to start. One soldier who came home with PTSD was Infantry Warrant Officer Harry Roberts. During a tour of Iraq in 2004, Harry had been badly injured by a roadside bomb. Oh, fuck. And although his physical injuries were treated, his PTSD went undiagnosed. A year later, Harry was back on the front line again, this time in Afghanistan. Not long after returning from Afghanistan, Harry left the military. And within a few short years, after fighting his own private war, he had drank himself to death. Now the tragic circumstances of his death came as a shock to many who knew him, but the story itself is a familiar one, and across the British Isles, many soldiers continue to fight a losing battle with a faceless and relentless enemy. Stuart Taylor was directly involved in some of the heaviest fighting that took place during his 2004 tour of Iraq. After he came home, Stuart was diagnosed with PTSD, but he had to fight to get the treatment he needed. Um, I was told that I was going to get an appointment on my arrival back to the UK, and, and that appointment never came. I, I spent the next two years sitting at my parents' house, uh, battling my own battle, you know, in my bedroom. Pretty much. So for two two years, you literally sort of cast adrift yep. and left your own devices. Yeah. Not not a word from from anyone. So how did what happened next after after that? Um, my parents then got extremely worried about you know what was happening with me. Uh, I'd started binge drinking and, and and all sorts and getting in trouble and. I'm bleeding. What? Get me here. Uh, 
uh, they were the ones that then contacted Muller Regiment and, uh, and that's when the ball started rolling with a psychiatrist again. And uh, you got some professional treatment this time, who was this from? Uh, this was uh, a doctor up in Woolwich. Um, I went to see him about four or five times and he then uh, sent me to a Priory Hospital, which is a, a hospital for drunks and drug users. So not, things not, for, not for soldiers. <laughs> so the next real stage for you in your recovery was, was combat stress. Yeah. Right. How did you get involved with combat stress? Yeah, I was referred to uh, combat stress by a friend and uh, that was one of the best things that happened to me. Um, to start off with, I went there at the end of 2007. Uh, it, was, it was allocated six weeks a year in two week periods. And it was good, you'd go there and recharge your batteries really. Uh, get a bit of therapy, art therapy, all sorts of different things. You just completely take your mind off of the outside world. What was the big difference, say, between combat stress and the Priory? Um, combat stress was filled with ex-servicemen that was going through exactly what I was going through, really. Um, and you could connect with them and, and you could talk t to each other about symptoms because you know, obviously, you're both suffering from yeah. the same thing. You're not going to get any uh, stigma from it. Um, and the first months afterwards, I would almost say I was free from post-traumatic stress, but as we were told, things would creep back in. Which I did, but I'd, I'd been given the tools to, to be able to uh, combat the stress <laughs> as such. How do you think things would have panned out if you, uh, if you didn't get this help from combat stress? Um, if I'm brutally honest, I think I probably would have ended my life. Really? <laughs> All right, okay. Sorry. Stuart's illness took him right to the edge. But thanks to the timely intervention of combat stress, he was able to pull his life back on track. The impact that this particular charity has on veterans' mental health cannot be understated. But there's another factor that plays a huge role in a PTSD sufferer's recovery, and that's the family. Combat stress may have treated Stuart's symptoms, but it was his family that ultimately gave him the strength he needed to fight. Seeing Stuart with his family made me realise that the illness affects many more people than just a veteran. So what I really needed to do was to speak to a partner of a PTSD sufferer. Um, he, he was a different man to the man that, um, that left for the tour. He, he was angry a lot of the time. <laughs> didn't want to participate in usual family things. Our children were, were, were quite young um, um, at that point in time. And um, it, yeah, he, he didn't want to spend um, any, a normal home environment um, seemed to upset him. So there's some pretty big changes then how did the kids respond to all of this? Yeah, it's been particularly tough for him and the children. Um, I think women can be quite adaptable, um, but the difference of the dad that, that left uh, for that final tour um, was a different man to the one that came home. So um, initially I think they just adapted to change, um, but then the, the, the fun guy that went uh, didn't, didn't return even when he got more comfortable with being at home. Did they have to modify their behaviour at all in response to their dad's PTSD? Yeah, their behaviour did have to change. Um, he's intolerant of noise, um, doesn't like being snuck up on, um, even, you know, accidentally. He's, 
hearing's crap, so if they were to come into a room quietly, um, it could cause drama, so yeah, their behaviour had to change. Jane, can I first ask when your husband, what, what year did he leave the military? He left the military in 2008. And when did he get round to seeking help? 2016, eight years. That's a long gap. It's a huge amount of time. Why do you think it took so long for him to come forward and ask for help? I think a large chunk of it was, was pride. Um, not wanting to admit that he was different or that he was unwell. Um, and I think another part of it is the fact that these soldiers have to fight and look very hard for support. It's not readily available and there's a huge stigma with, even, even still today, with PTSD. So now, now he's actually had some treatment. Can I ask, how is he now with you and the kids? He does seem, he does seem more together at the moment. He's, um, he's found another path to walk and um, I think it gives him, I think it gives him some degree of peace. One of the main barriers to people seeking help for mental illness is stigma. It's a point that's already been raised here, but one that is of particular relevance to soldiers. In the hyper-masculine world of the military, going on the sick for anything is a risky business. From day one of basic training, a soldier's bombarded with pressure from his peers and from those in command not to go sick. So unless you have a bone poking out, or some serious arterial bleeding, you'll find no sympathy from your comrades or the chain of command. Of course, a soldier can go sick any time he wants, but actually doing it is a bit more difficult than it sounds. A soldier on the sick is a hindrance to his comrades, who now have to work twice as hard just because a weak link couldn't hack it. He's lazy, work shy, and also quite possibly a homosexual. And when it comes to mental illness, where no obvious injury is present, it's even worse. And the stigma attached to mental illness is deeply ingrained in military culture. During World War I, many with PTSD were thought to be simply malingering, and those who were taken seriously were branded hysterical. And back then, hysteria was most commonly associated with women, and no one wants to be a big girl, which in military terms is nearly as bad as being a great big mincing faggot. And this is toxic masculinity at its very worst. And I would suggest that if simply going to see the doctor means that your very sexuality is suddenly questioned, then there is a big problem with the system. And when people can't come forward for treatment, the problem doesn't go away. It festers, it intensifies, and more often than not, ends in tragedy. One ex-soldier who felt he couldn't ask for help was Danny Johnson. Danny had served with distinction in both the infantry and with special duties, completing multiple tours of Iraq and Afghanistan. Danny had had PTSD symptoms after his last tour, but fearful of the repercussions, he decided not to seek help. Instead, he began to self-medicate with Valium, and when his unprescribed Valium use was discovered, he was discharged. No counselling, no therapy, nothing. Just a discharge. After his discharge, his mental health took a further turn for the worse. And after a series of personal and professional setbacks, Danny ended his life in a secluded woodland close to his home. So today, almost a year after the event, I've come to speak to his mother to find out exactly what happened. And to be honest, this is one interview that I haven't been looking forward to. Um, he was 
very, very intelligent. He was always a, a good child. He was considerate of people, very loyal friend. Um, but he was just a real sweet boy. I honestly thought when he was little that uh, he would stay with me forever because he was a mummy's boy. I never dreamt for one moment he'd end up doing the things he did. Did he, can I ask, did he leave with uh, many qualifications? No, um, the last two years he was at school, he actually started to go off the rails a bit. Um, there were problems uh, with, with him, his attendance at school. I was up there many, many times. Um, he never did anything terrible. He just hated the authority of it. Uh, he left school at the, the first chance uh, he had, and then we were having a bit of a problem because he he took a couple of minor jobs, uh, and he was sleeping all day, sitting up playing computer games all night. <laughs> I think he suddenly realised realised he needed discipline in his life, and I think because of his character at the time, he thought that was a way of doing it. I couldn't believe it when he came home and told me that he'd been to Chichester, um, and joined up. And joined up. I I laughed because I I just couldn't believe, with hit the character he had that he would in any way you know shape or form actually do it, actually succeed at it. But he was a brilliant soldier from the time he started. I think maybe he suddenly realised there was a lot more to it when he was first sent overseas, and I believe that would have been Afghanistan. Now, when he came back from that tour, did you notice uh, any differences in his behaviour or anything? Um, yeah, his, his temp temper was certainly not as easy going. Um, we had quite a few problems with, you know, falling out. Um, he'd brought his army helmet home and he used it to bash holes in doors, you know, in argument, in arguments with with his brother and with me. We've still got the holes, but he was always eager to get back to it. He he never ever didn't want to go back. He. I really feel that I lost him the day he went. The day he went back? The day he went in the army. So not long after his first tour ends, Danny's already displaying signs of PTSD. But despite this, he volunteers for and passes selection for the Special Reconnaissance Regiment. Now the SRR is a special duties unit, and I can tell you from personal experience that if you serve in any special duties unit, the pace of operational life increases drastically. And it's not unusual for operators to quickly find themselves locked in a perpetual cycle of six months on and six months off. And that six months off isn't actually off. You may be back in the UK, but now you've got language courses, tradecraft training, first aid training, weapons training and exercises as well. And before you know it, you're back on pre-deployment training for your next operational tour. And if you're really unlucky and some poor fucker gets killed, you can find yourself on the next plane back out as a battle casualty replacement. It's pretty relentless. Uh, 
Um, Danny had at that time been suffering with terrible sleep problems for several years. Um, and he was, when he was home <clears throat> on leave, he was self-medicating mainly with booze. But at that time he'd got some Valium from someone from a friend. Um, they were arrested for, um, I don't know, or maybe they were just being searched in the street after the concert. And they found um, a prescription, well not a prescription, they found some pills on Danny that was not his prescription. Um, he was arrested and the police reported it back to his superiors. Um, Danny went back, there was a lot of toing and froing for about six months, but then he was just discharged from the army. Had he approached anyone for help at this stage? Again, he could never approach anyone for help because it would be on his record and he would, he'd have been out. So he was, he was, you'd say he was scared to approach yeah, people? Yeah, absolutely. He, he couldn't. He honestly just felt he had his back against a wall. There was no one he could turn to um, for help in any way and this is why he self-medicated. I've often, I've asked the question uh, of the coroner, uh, to the coroner, um, when we were leading up to the inquest is that when he was actually originally found with Valium was he offered any help? Was Did, did uh, SRR invite him to get help? Did they give him any alternatives to to just kicking him out? Um, and I, I'm, I'm absolutely certain that no one ever ever offered him any help. <laughs> After Danny was discharged, he did what a lot of ex-soldiers with no civilian qualifications do. He went into private security and began work in the oil fields in Iraq. But as anyone will tell you, riding shotgun for oil workers or guarding some remote facility in the middle of the desert doesn't quite give you the same level of job satisfaction that you had in the military. And unsurprisingly, Danny quickly got bored and in desperation he reapplied to the army. And just when it looked as though they were going to take him back, he received the news telling him it wasn't going to happen. For Danny, this seems to have been the final straw. And during that last week of his life, we could see him just getting worse and worse every day. I begged him to get help, but again he couldn't because he said if he, if he, you know, if he goes to a doctor, if he gets any help, he'd never work in that field again, and that meant everything to him. And I honestly felt that if he knew he had a safe place with people who loved him, that that might get him through, but it wasn't enough. And the following Sunday he went missing again. Um, and his body was found on the Wednesday. What should we be doing now, differently? There should be more help um, when you're serving. You, there should be more uh, understanding of, of mental health. Um, and also for when veterans in their life after the army, they need a lot more help. I think at the moment the military um, we'll give them up to a year, I believe, up to a year, um, and then that's it. But everyone knows now that PTSD sometimes doesn't kick in for, you know, from two to 12 years, I believe. Right. And, and not, and not a, a, an NHS appointment that takes six weeks plus to come through. Um, there, there needs to be a 24-hour emergency helpline because if you're suicidal you can't wait six weeks 
It's the difference between life and death for these guys. No, completely. And what would you say to any other families of servicemen or service women who are going through a similar situation to what you were going through, Danny? Reach out to his friends. Reach out to anyone that he may... If he won't speak to you or she won't speak to you or won't go and seek professional help, reach out to his friends because just one of those friends might come along and make all the difference. It might be the difference between life and death to them. Because especially if it's a, a, a veteran friend who understands exactly what they're going through, that little tiny bit of understanding could make all the difference. But don't do what I do. Don't just hope for the best. Reach out, and if they won't do it, you do it. The issue of veteran suicide isn't going to go away of its own accord. And until the government commits in a realistic and meaningful way, ex-soldiers with PTSD will continue to rely heavily on the work of charities. And they'll continue to die too. An example of something meaningful would be to simply keep a central record of all veteran suicides. Our allies, America, Australia and New Zealand, already do this, but we don't. And without accurate records, how do you ever measure your success or failure in tackling the problem? The answer is, you can't. And many observers now believe that it suits the government and the MOD to keep it this way, because now they never have to acknowledge the full extent of the problem. It's a sad state of affairs. And as far as I'm concerned, every MP and senior MOD official should hang their heads in shame. And it's also no secret that the MOD actively targets our poorest and least educated citizens, with some being recruited as young as 16 years of age. Now this has always gone on, and Britain is in no way unique in this practice. Those with the least have always been called on to sacrifice everything. They go to war, they fight, they die. And these men and women have only the very slenderest of stakes in the society they fight for. Most don't even own their own homes yet they still go when called. And when the time comes for them to leave the military, they quite often have little idea how to function in civilian society. One only has to look at the disproportional number of ex-soldiers currently languishing at Her Majesty's pleasure to see that something's rotten in the state of Denmark. And when the service person concerned is also suffering from PTSD, the chances of them making a successful transition to civilian life is diminished even further. Then they have to fight the most deadly enemy they'll ever face, themselves. Because today, the good old British Tommy is by far more likely to die at his own hand than be killed on the battlefield. So to get your whole... Action Man. Action Man Battlefield Casualties. For PTSD Action Man, danger lurks at every turn. He never feels safe, not even in his own home. Ah! Ah! Do what you can to block out the memories. Look, look, look. With no support from HQ, it's up to you to find a way. Looks like we're on our own. <laughs> PTSD Action Man now comes with Thousand Yard Stare Action. With time running out, only you can stop the pain. Let's get out of here. Oh my god, dude.
Waves, waves of blood and fire